human um, intestinal cavity uh, collectively uh, houses approximately 100 trillion bacteria that are both good and bad in terms of modulating our responses, our immune responses to a variety of exposures that we encounter. These bacteria have co-evolved with us for millennia and help the human body mount several different uh, responses. For example, the bacteria that we have are helpful in mediating uh, the creation of certain vitamins. You cannot produce vitamin K if you don't have certain bacteria inside your body. And over the last couple of years, we have now identified that uh, the intestinal microbiome also mediates immune responses, in particular, immune responses to that the body essentially mounts against foreign organisms. Uh, and those foreign entities and organisms actually include cancers as well. Uh, so you might ask, how could this possibly be the case? Well, um, one, um, the body's immune system needs to be taught. Uh, we have essentially an innate immune system that is capable of recognizing and treating and mounting responses to commonly encountered pathogens such as viruses and bacteria. However, the adaptive arm of the immune response is what is really required to maintain long-lasting, effective anti-bacterial, uh, viral, or actually anti-tumor immune responses. And it is particularly the adaptive arm of the immune response that is T-cell mediated that essentially requires a certain amount of teaching. Um, and this teaching essentially is what uh, we think that gut bacteria actually help uh, mediate. So the microbiome influences immunity throughout life, um, from early development into adulthood. And it makes sense since the intestinal tract is a huge immune surface area and it's in constant interaction with um, commensal bacteria. So this interaction is a really important point since it's not likely that it's just one-way communication, but there's probably some crosstalk going on um, between the microbiome and the immune system constantly um, through things like microbial products and peptides um, in metabolites. The topic of discussion today is the microbiome and cancer therapy, and certainly there's a huge immunologic component to cancer um, at all stages from, you know, the incidence of cancer um, and certainly in therapy, especially now with the popularity of um, immunotherapy in, in the cancer space. So cancer immune surveillance is actually a hypothesis that was actually coined by Paul Ehrlich almost a hundred odd years ago now. It uh, essentially speaks to this idea that the body's immune system is engaging in a constant state of surveillance to try and weed out cancerous cells. So all of us are developing cancers on a daily basis because cancer is really a function of life. It's a function of cellular division and development. The body must have ability to recognize and eliminate these aberrant cells. And that process of recognizing and, ab and eliminating these aberrant cells is done immune surveillance. The immune surveillance hypothesis by Paul Ehrlich that was then advanced by Burnett and Thomas. However, the very uh, process by which the cancer is uh, being eliminated also results in the cancer actually developing adaptive responses to hide from the immune system. And one such development is the expression of certain inhibitory ligands, such as PDL1. And in order to understand that, one has to think about the biggest advance in cancer uh, immunotherapy, which is really the advent of checkpoint inhibitors that essentially break that tolerance mechanism. They essentially break those mechanisms by which uh, the body's immune system recognizes foreign substances such as tumors, but is prevented from attacking those by these adaptive uh, inhibitory mechanisms such as the expression of pd ligand one and the B7, CD28 interaction as well. They essentially you know, produce durable remissions or functional cures in a wide range of human uh, cancers. However, one thing that we have now learned is that as a result of these, uh, uh, these treatments, uh, not everybody appears to benefit. A large number of people appear to benefit very well uh, from these treatments. However, a small segment of people appear to either benefit and then stop benefiting. That is, they develop a response and then they stop responding. So the cancers actually shrink and then grow. 
or the cancers just grow to begin with. They can't, the, the, the patients never experience a response. And the question is why? So far, um, what's been shown in the publication that I co-authored um, along with others is that yes, features of the microbiome can predict response to immunotherapy, you know, mathematically. Importantly, what we saw when we um, transplanted the microbiome of these responders with this beneficial uh, microbiome signature and vice versa with um, kind of a detrimental um, type of signature. Um, we saw that the mice that got those transplants could recapitulate the phenotype of the donor. So this indicated that the microbiome has a potentially causal role in the response to cancer immunotherapy. And kind of importantly, when we um, looked um, at these mice uh, compared to the non-responder mice, Responder mice, um, those who got the responder um, uh, uh, donor material and that also responded to the therapy in terms of their growth curves, they had more CD4 cells in their periphery and they also had uh, more CD8 T cells in their periphery and in their um, tumors. So that makes sense given what we mechanistically know about how anti-PD-1 works. The idea that the composition of one's intestinal microbia could affect the response to anti-cancer therapy actually predates the effective uh, the adv the advent of effective immunotherapy. This was known even with chemo. But it just so happened that with immunotherapies, people did the same experiments over again, and I, I have now identified that there appear to be two things that the immune therapy that the intestinal microbiota appear to do in relation to immune therapy. One, the composition of the gut bacteria appear to affect whether or not some people respond to immune therapy. And the key, the key point here is some people. It is hard to say that the intestinal microbiome or the composition of the intestinal microbiome is going to affect everybody's response to immunotherapy. We don't know what fraction of people have good or bad intestinal microbiomes, and it's still a contentious question as to exactly what constitutes good and what constitutes bad. It appears to be that uh, diversity, that is the microbial diversity, appears to be a good prognostic factor. And that's kind of like saying that if you, have, if you have many, many, many different bugs, and again, recall that normal gut population is about 100 trillion bugs. Having 100 trillion different bugs is a lot better than having 100 trillion of the same bug. And that kind of stands to reason, right? I mean, who really wants to live in a monolithic culture, right? If everybody every, everywhere kind of looked the same, it'd be kind of boring. So that's one factor that appears to be important. The second thing is that appear to be certain key constituent bacteria that appear to be very important in predicting res response. And those bacteria appear to include certain gram negatives that essentially mediate certain vital functions. Uh, and it's actually those functions that appear to be very important in determining what constitutes good and what constitutes bad. A large body of literature supports the notion that the gut microbiome is largely shaped by environmental factors over genetics. So genetics do play a role, but a lot of times, or in a lot of studies, um, the larger variation comes from environmental factors. And everyday medications are certainly very important, um, and particularly those that could be targeting the microbiome, uh, like probiotics and antibiotics. While probiotics have traditionally been considered pretty benign, they've come under a recent investigation um, out of their concern for, again, influence on the gut microbiome, which is now being linked to so many different diseases. And as one of the major functions of the microbiome is to aid in digestion of otherwise indigestible foods, uh, diet has been widely studied in the context of the microbiome. So for example, epidemiologic studies have looked at populations across the world for example, tribal populations that eat a lot of plant-based foods versus Western populations that don't eat plant-based foods and kind of the opposite, very high in saturated fats. And they've noted vast differences in their microbiomes. So intervention studies that are primarily focused on increasing fiber intake have also shown that the microbiome can change in response to these dietary um, changes. So Diet plays a big role, um, at least in adults, as we know, because that's where more, most of the studies have been conducted. And a lot of the research has been done on the role of fiber and short-chain fatty acid uh, metabolism as a potential mediator between diet and immune system um, effects downstream. And so in terms of cancer therapy, um, I've been studying probiotics and diet in the context of cancer immunotherapy 
um, since about 2015. At the time when I started looking at this, there actually hadn't been um, any studies uh, looking at uh, probiotics or diet um, in the context of cancer immunotherapy where I was interested in. And um, I worked with um, Jennifer Wargo at MD Anderson Cancer Center along with Lorenzo Cohen to kind of investigate this um, during my PhD thesis. And we definitely see some interesting things in terms of um, diet, uh, fiber in particular, and also probiotics use in patients that went on to receive um, immunotherapy that had metastatic melanoma. So for example, um, at MD Anderson Cancer Center, again, some of the co-authors on, on the work that I'm um, currently um, uh, trying to get out is uh, Carrie Daniel and Jen from Quaid. And they're actually conducting feeding studies in patients that are gonna be starting immunotherapy where patients are provided all of their meals uh, prior to starting immunotherapy and throughout treatment. And they're monitoring how um, feeding people different diets can change the microbiome and clinical outcomes. So th those will be really informative in terms of um, how diet and these other things may impact um, response to immunotherapy potentially through the microbiome. There's a group in Israel led by Gail Markel that essentially is doing a fecal microbiome transplants that uh, in melanoma in combination with checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And so one group is mentioned by Gail Markel is testing this in human cancer patients who have not responded to immunotherapy. The second group that is doing a very similar approach is our group with uh, Hassan, Zoror, and myself that is testing a very similar idea with a combination with um, uh, pembrolizumab, uh, microbiome transplants in combination with pembrolizumab to treat PD-1 non-responder patients. So the point is that uh, it looks like the fecal microbiome composition can be altered therapeutically to affect anti-cancer immune responses, in, at least by using a fecal microbiome transplant. So the idea that uh, uh, one can therefore augment or alter or modulate the intestinal microbiome uh, is a great one. But the question is, how can one do it outside of the context of the microbiome uh, complete microbiome transplants. But essentially, uh, one of the pro uh, prospects that I think is uh, most promising is the prospect of utilizing rationally designed consortia of live bacterial products uh, that uh, to try and elicit the effect that we're seeing with uh, FMT in, in, in rationally defined patient population. In the setting of cancer, uh, some, some, some experiments were done that essentially uh, identified a certain set of bacteria, particularly uh, 18 different bacteria that appear to mediate the effect of CD8 T cells. That are, these are the sentinels that essentially are the hallmark of the adaptive immune response that we, we talked about earlier. And these CD8 T cells can essentially be programmed by these bugs to essentially attack cancerous cells. You, you now don't have to give somebody an entire fecal transplant. You can give somebody very simply a, uh, uh, a capsule. And in this capsule, you have the bugs that do not appear to cause an infection. They don't appear to cause all those infections that you have to worry about when you give somebody a fecal microbiome transplant. And the bugs are obviously easy. The, the capsules are obviously easy to ingest. Uh, and can be given concurrently with checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And a study that we are heavily involved in at, uh, and was uh, presented at ACR describes this approach. So uh, the study is termed Consortium IO, and it's being led by uh, several uh, investigators, including myself uh, uh, and uh, other investigators at Florida Cancer Institute, such as Judy Wang and Martin Gutierrez, Anita Turk, and uh, these, th in this particular study, essentially what we're doing is we're giving people this particular live bacterial consortia in a pill, along with a checkpoint inhibitor uh, nivolumab, to treat essentially advanced and uh, treatment refractory melanoma, gastric and G-junction cancers, and colorectal cancer. The study is still very early. We are still very, uh, we are very optimistic. Actually, a lot of microbiome research in uh, human cancer immunotherapy um, was really pioneered looking at GBHD and just in the context of stem cell transplant in general, uh, particularly by Marcel Vandenbrink's group at Memorial Sloan Kettering. So in their seminal work, which again preceded a lot of these um, studies on cancer checkpoint immunotherapy, they showed that higher alpha diversity, uh, which what, what I mentioned, um, which is what I mentioned earlier, um, we looked at as well, 
um, in these transplant patients was associated with lower rates of GVHD um, and lower rates of GVHD related mortality and also relapse rates and uh, survival post transplant. So they've also done a lot of really important work looking at the use of different antibiotics in the context of GVHD. Um, antibiotics, again, have a huge impact on microbial composition. Um, and that work is super important in terms of guiding clinical care because antibiotics are really, really heavily used um, in, in transplant populations. Uh, just to highlight uh, one interesting um, kind of publication in the space recently. So Marcel's group uh, had a publication a couple months ago, um, just monster sample size of something like 9,000 profiled uh, samples in over 1,400 patients. And again, they found here that consistent with their previous findings, higher alpha diversity was associated with lower risk of death and lower risk of death specifically related to GBHD um, in these patients. So again, this doesn't necessarily prove causality, but that's a huge sample size and really powerful evidence um, for, again, the role of the microbiome in GBHD and, and stem cell transplant outcomes. Finally, one of the very interesting things that has come out of a lot of these, uh, these, these analyses have been the idea that um, besides uh, mediating response to immunotherapy, one of the other things that bacteria can appear to do is also mediate side effects, toxicities. And how could that be the case? We've seen this with fecal microbiome transplants because fecal microbiome transplants are now being also used to treat GVHD. But one could ask whether or not certain bacterial consortia could, for example, be given to patients with either very severe immune therapy side effects uh, to try and reverse those, or given in together with certain immune therapies such as the PD-1-CTLA-4 combination that has a high rate of severe side effects to try and reduce the frequency of those severe side effects. And those are all uh, ideas that are percolating through the clinical trial investigational space and may see uh, actual testing in the future. So it, it looks like, uh, like uh, this entire field is essentially very, very, very promising. And, uh, you know, the next couple of years uh, will help us uh, decide, you know, just what role augmenting the intestinal microbiome may play in both mediating uh, effective anti-cancer immunotherapies and as well as uh, affecting resistance to anti-cancer immunotherapy and augmenting and reversing side effects that are elicited by anti-cancer immunotherapies.